Thank you for choosing Access On Demand. We're the fastest growing home health technology company, helping improve care for more than 1.5 million patients and trusted by more than 7,000 healthcare organizations to grow their business. Access is a firm believer in continuing training and we create content so you can learn and grow anywhere, anytime. Let's get started. Hello, Access is pleased to present Get Ready for Oasis D with Confidence. My name is Sean Hamilton. I am the lead clinical product manager here at Access. I am also coding and OASIS certified with over 24 years of home health experience, and it is my pleasure to be your presenter. This session is regarding the new GG functional abilities and goals section in the OASIS D. But before we begin, I would recommend that you guys think about printing the slides that are available at the end of the presentation, because as we go through those scenarios, it will be helpful if you have those slides available, mainly the GG section slides. You don't have to print the M1800 slides for this presentation, but it would be more helpful for you if you had those as we were going, as I said, through the scenarios. All right, so the objectives are that by the end of this session, you will understand the fundamental differences between M1800 functional questions versus the GG functional abilities and goals questions, and that you will also be able to demonstrate knowledge to correctly answer the section GG functional abilities and goals questions. As I mentioned in the last webinar in part one, there are six new items in the OASIS D. Four of those items are in the section GG, Functional Abilities and Goals. So we're looking at the prior functioning of everyday activities, prior device use, self-care, and then lastly, mobility. And again, here's section J, health conditions that we reviewed on part one regarding falls. And you guys can always go back to that webinar video to review that information. So GG0100, prior functioning, start of care, resumption of care. This item identifies the patient's usual abilities with everyday activities prior to their current illness, exacerbation, or injury. So as we go through all of these GG questions, it's basically always related to their prior to their current illness, exacerbation, or injury. You may review the clinical record and also interview the patient or their representative. This question is so important because it paints the picture of what the patient looked like prior to this episode of care. And it also gives a hint towards the patient's rehab potential. So we wanna make sure that we assess this correctly. Now this item causes the clinician to assess the patient's self-care and their ADLs, indoor mobility in the ambulation, stairs, and functional cognition. To the left, you would see, we will code the patient as independent, needed some help, dependent, unknown, or not applicable. And they give you very good definitions for what uh, the coding items mean, okay? Now code 09, which is not applicable, we will use that if the activity was not applicable to the patient prior to this current illness, exacerbation, or injury. And as an example, Medicare talked about stairs. And the example said to code NA not applicable if the client never used stairs prior to, prior to this episode. And then the dash, which indicates no information is available, is a valid response, but expected to be a rare occurrence. So we really should be able to um, ascertain from the patient or the caregiver what that patient's prior functioning status was. GG110, prior device use. This information is collected at start of care and resumption of care. This item identifies the patient's use of devices and aids immediately prior to the current illness, exacerbation, 
or injury to align treatment goals. And we will look at treatment goals in a minute. And as you can imagine, this is very important because this helps to determine the patient's rehab potential. As we look at this item, you can see that this is a check all that apply question. We are assessing for use of a manual wheelchair, a motorized wheelchair and our scooter, a mechanical lift, walker, orthotics, prosthetics, or none of the above. As a note, we are given definitions and examples of a mechanical lift in a walker. So a mechanical lift is any device a patient or a caregiver requires for lifting or supporting the patient's body weight. The guidance states, examples include, but are not limited to, a stair lift, horia lift, or a bathtub lift. And then they're looking at all types of walkers. And examples include, but are not limited to, a pickup walker, a hemi walker, rolling walker, or a platform walker. We're to check Z, which is none of the above, if the patient did not use any of the listed devices or aids immediately prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. And again, a DASH is a valid response for this item, but CMS expects that DASH use is a rare occurrence. Let's look at an, at an example. Mr. C. Mr. C has bilateral lower extremity neuropathy secondary to his diabetes. And prior to this current episode, he used a cane. Today, he is using a walker. So how would you code GG110 prior device use? If you said Z, none of the above, you would be correct. A cane is not a device included as part of the item list above. So remember, not all devices and aids are included in this item. Now let's talk about the MOO 1800 questions versus the GG functional abilities questions. Um, I, I think in the beginning, this is going to be the hardest transition to the OASIS D. Um, as far as understanding the difference between answering questions for the MOO 1800s versus the GG questions. I want you to understand that these are assessed and responded to differently. So hopefully you have had a chance to print the tools on the slides at the end of the presentation because it'll help you to um, understand some of the, of the things that I'm speaking of as we go through the webinar here. So let's talk about the MOO 1800s. These are scored according to the patient's ability and safety to complete an activity. Okay, so that's a part of the guidance and the conventions of OASIS. You're going to score according to the patient's ability to safely complete an activity. We do not consider whether a device is present, and we do not consider whether a person is present. So here's an example. Let's say I have a patient that walks with a cane and holds onto their furniture. It is obvious the patient is unsteady, and they're not safe with ambulating on uneven surfaces, steps, or stairs. However, my patient lives alone and does not have a walker. When looking at M1860 ambulation, a lot of clinicians get confused on how to answer this question. Again, the guidance tells us to not consider whether a device or a person is available, but to consider what the patient can safely do to complete the activity. Therefore, I would code this patient as two for M1860 which is a two-handed device or no device with intermittent human assistance or supervision. You are not being dishonest. I've had so many nurses to say that to me. Again, you have to understand that the OASIS is a data collection tool that is integrated into our discipline-specific assessments. The conventions and guidance direct us on how they want us to collect the data so that it's standardized. 
So keep that in mind when you are answering the Moot 1800 questions. Now let's talk about the GG questions, functional abilities. We will score those according to the amount of helper assistance required to safely complete an activity. So again, it's not the patient's ability, it's the amount of helper assistance that's required and safety has preeminence here as well. And again, do not consider whether a device is present. So let's talk about some special considerations for GG130 and GG170 from the guidance. These are assessed at start of care, resumption of care, follow up and discharge. And at start of care and resumption of care, you will assess the patient's performance level and a discharge goal for each activity. The follow-up performance is assessed at the research or in other follow-up, which some still call SCICs. The discharge performance is assessed at discharge and compared to the discharge goals that were entered at start of care and resumption of care. Reports from the patient, the medical record, and the family are acceptable, but direct observation is preferred. Now, obviously, guys, Medicare does not intend for us to ask patients or family members if a patient can walk or transfer safely, as an example. We need to assess the patients for safety, their fall risk. However, if the patient has already performed an activity, uh, such as oral hygiene, you may obtain that information from the patient and family, and also you can assess other similar activity to arrive to your conclusion. The key here is that we have to get away from interviewing patients, and um, to be successful, we must assess the patient. In part one of this webinar series, we also talked about the one clinician rule. And it is stated here in the guidance for the GG130 and GG170 questions that when possible, CMS invites a multidisciplinary approach to the patient assessment. So that makes sense because they do understand that a lot of these questions are heavily related to what the therapist does in the field. So they are giving us the ability to collaborate and in our evaluations, therapy evaluations in Access, when we release those, you will have the ability for collaboration in the software if your agency policies allow that. Remember, that is the most important thing. You must put into your agency policy that you allow collaboration between assessing clinicians. So it can't just be a therapist looking at the questions. They have to have actually participated in assessing the patient. Continuing with the guidance, it is also stated that patients should be allowed to perform activities as independently as possible as long as they are safe. If the helper assistance is required because the patient's performance is unsafe or poor quality, you will score according to the amount of assistance provided. So again, we're looking at safety and you're gonna score the patient according to the amount of assistance. Activities may be completed with or without assistive devices. Use of assistive devices to complete an activity should not affect coding the activity. And we just stated that. Patients with cognitive impairments or limitations may need physical and or verbal assistance when completing an activity. So you want to code based on the patient's need for assistance to perform the activity safely. That's like M1800, the, the MU 1800s, I should say. It's all about safety. So for example, if a patient is a choking risk, due to their rate of eating, they're gonna need a lot of verbal cueing. The amount of food placed into their mouth, people with dementia have uh, pockets of food in their mouth all the time, or the risk of falling. Um, so it goes without saying in your assessment, 
if you state that a patient has any cognitive deficits, then an auditor would not expect, or I shouldn't say an auditor, but the QA, the person that is reviewing the documentation, would not expect to see that the patient is independent in any activity if there are cognitive issues. Now, this is a tool that I developed for coding responses. And again, it's located at the back of the uh, presentation, but it's to help you to easily arrive at the correct answers for the functional abilities section. And this works for GG130 as well as GG170. So when you look over to the right, you see the type of assistance from in the, which is independent all the way down to dependent. And then right to the left of the type of assistance are the codes, 06 to 01. Now, when we get to the left, the instructions are for you to read each description. And if it describes the type of assistance the patient is requiring, you're going to select yes and then code that level of assistance. If the answer is no, then you simply need to go to the next level until you find the right type of assistance that the patient is requiring. So if you start to the left and it says patient safely completes the activity by him or herself without physical or verbal helper assistance, if you say yes, then you're going to code 06 independent. If you say no, then you will go to the next level. The patient completes the activity but requires helper to only set up or clean up prior to or following the activity, but not during the activity. That's the key point right there. This assistance is not during the activity. So they give examples such as cutting up food, opening containers, setting up hygiene items, or um, assistive devices, you know, grabbing their assistive devices for them. So if you say yes, you're going to code that 05, set up, clean up, assistance. If your answer is no, you will go to the next level, which is patient need verbal cues, steadying, or contact guard throughout activity or intermittently, i.e., they need verbal cueing, coaxing, or supervision for safety to complete the activity, or incidental help such as contact guard or steadying. So the key here is that this is throughout the activity or it's intermittently. And if you say yes, you will answer 04, supervision or touching assistance. And then if you say no, you will move to the next. Now these last three have to do with physical assistance. So if the patient is in need of physical assistance from one helper providing less than half the effort, for instance, the helper lifts, holds, or supports the trunk or limbs, then you would say yes, which is zero three, partial assistance or moderate assistance. If the answer is no, when you go to the next question, basically you're saying they need assistance from one helper but that helper is pro providing more than half the effort. And so if you say yes, the helper is providing more than half the effort, you would code that 02, which is substantial or maximum assistance. If your answer is no, then you go to the next line, which is helper does all the effort or assistance of two or more helpers is required. And if the answer is yes, zero 01 is dependent. Now, for no, we have to look at activity not attempted. And there are five codes here for activity not attempted. The first one is zero 07, the patient refused. If the patient refused to complete the activity, you would enter zero 07. Now, we certainly hope to not see that frequently. Um, and for sure, there are patients that will tell us they, they don't want to do a certain activity, but we need to do whatever we can to try to ensure that they understand why we are collecting this information. If the patient did not attempt to perform the activity, 
and did not perform this activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury, we will code that 09, not applicable. If the patient did not attempt this activity due to environmental limitations, and examples include lack of equipment or weather constraints, um, certainly if there's in, in a inclement weather, we're going to code that as a 10, not attempted due to environmental limitations. If the activity was not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns, we would code that 88 not attempted due to medical conditions or safety concerns. And then a dash is a valid response for these items, but you do not want to use a dash if any of the above apply to this patient. Remember, a dash is expected to be a rare occurrence. So you would code the dash, which is no information is available. So these are the self-care instructions for GG130. And as you can see, this information is collected at start of care, resumption of care, follow-up and discharge. And all of these are not the same. Um, they don't have you to collect the same information um, at each time point, at follow-up, there's less information to collect, and we'll talk about that shortly. But um, here, they're basically saying you need to code the patient's usual performance as start of care, resumption of care, for each activity using the six-point scale. If activity was not attempted at start of care or resumption of care, then you have to code the reason. And we talked about those not attempted codes. And then they also say you need to code the patient's discharge goals using the six-point scale. Use of codes 070910 or 88 is permissible to code discharge goals as well. Okay, let's look at the self-care responses. So at start of care and resumption of care, you're looking at the performance and discharge goals. And then at recertification, you're looking at the follow-up performance. And at discharge, you're looking at the DC performance and you're wanting to know, did you meet your goals? Did the patient meet the goals that you guys established together at discharge? Now remember, CMS does invite a multidisciplinary approach to complete this information. When answering this item, we must look at what is included as well as what is excluded. And this is going to be important so we're not confused by the MU1800 questions, okay? So when we look at eating, the first thing I want you to do is to notice that it does not include preparation. So we're just looking at the patient's use of the suitable utensils and the ability to bring food and liquids to their mouth. And we'll look more deeply at eating in just a second. Now, oral hygiene includes the ability to be able to properly care for dentures. So that is there. It's in the, in the MOO 1800 questions there, but it's here as well. Toileting is coded if the patient uses a toilet, a bedside commode, bedpan, or if they are incontinent. It also includes the ability to manage the ostomy, and it includes wiping the opening, but not managing the equipment. So when you're looking at shower and bathing self in E, you're answering it totally different than the MOO questions. So when assessing shower here in the GG section, it excludes washing of the hair and back and getting in and out of the shower. If you would recall under M1830, which is bathing, if a patient requires assistance with washing their hair or their back, are getting in and out of the shower, you would select response two, which is intermittent caregiver assistance and verbal cueing. So again, on the surface, it would look like you're being contradictory, but you're not. We're following the rules. So these are Medicare rules and we just have to follow them. So under the MOO 1830 question, you could be saying, that the patient requires intermittent caregiver assistance and verbal cueing. So our key is verbal cueing. But then when you get to the GG question, 
you could say the patient is independent. Lower body dressing in the GG questions does not include footwear. It does in M1820 for lower body dressing. So here under H, this is where they decided to put footwear. Safety, or I should say safe mobility, is the item that is stressed here. And so again, on the surface, under lower body dressing, if you're saying a patient is not safe with their mobility because of their shoes in the GG section, well, in M1820, it does include putting on shoes as well. So you would definitely want to make sure that you indicate that there's a safety issue in M1800, I should say M1820, as there is in H of GG130. Okay, now let's look at a special consideration for answering the items regarding eating. So again, eating is the ability to use suitable utensils to bring food and or liquid to the mouth and swallow food and or liquid once the meal is placed before the patient. So what if your patient uses a G-tube or TPN? Assistance with tube feedings or TPN is not considered when coding the item eating for obvious reasons. Now, if the patient does not eat or drink by mouth and relies solely on nutrition and liquids due to feedings or TPN due to a new or recent medical condition, you're going to use the code 88 not attempted due to medical condition or safety reasons. If the patient does not eat or drink by mouth at the time of assessment and the patient did not eat or drink by mouth, prior to the current illness, injury, or exacerbation, we will use 09, not applicable. If you will remember from the table we looked at, um, anytime a patient cannot be assessed, the activity cannot be assessed, you have to ask yourself, could they perform this activity before this episode? And if the answer is yes, then you're going to say it's not attempted due to a medical condition or safety reason. And if you ask yourself, could they perform it prior? And the answer is no, and they can't do it currently, then we're going to put not applicable. Now, if the patient eats and drinks by mouth and relies partially on obtaining nutrition, and we have this happen all the time, we have patients on G-tubes and they may eat once a day, we would then code their eating based on the amount of assistance that the patient requires to eat and drink by mouth, even if it's just that one time a day. So let's look at a special self-care consideration for eating regarding a patient with a visual deficit. So as an example, we have Mrs. V. Mrs. V has difficulty seeing on her left side since her stroke. During meals, a helper must remind her to scan the entire plate to ensure she has seen all of her food. So let's think about how we would code her. Eating would be coded 04, supervision or assistance. The helper provides verbal cueing assistance as Mrs. V completes the activity of eating. Supervision, such as reminders, may be provided throughout the activity or intermittently. Okay, let's look at an eating practice scenario. Mrs. J is being admitted to your agency due to CVA two weeks ago, and she is now MPO. Her nutrition, hydration needs are to be met via G2 feedings administered by her daughter. How would you code this patient for eating? 01, dependent. 02, substantial maximal assistance. 09, not applicable. Code 88 not attempted due to medical conditions or safety concerns. How would you code that? If you chose D, you would be correct. The answer is not attempted due to medical conditions or safety concerns because the patient was eating prior to their CVA. Let's look at another scenario. 
Mrs. J cannot swallow any food or liquid secondary to ALS. She has a J tube and has been on tube feedings for several years. She has been admitted to skilled home health care for treatment of a sacral pressure injury. Her treatment includes TPN to support wound healing. So let's look at how we would score that one. So we're talking about the start of care performance for eating. If you said 09, not applicable, that would be correct. Discharge, how would you code her for discharge? 09, not applicable, that would be correct. Mrs. J does not eat or drink by mouth at the time of the assessment and did not eat or drink by mouth prior to the current illness, injury, or exacerbation. And Mrs. J is not expected to eat or drink by mouth by discharge. Okay, let's look at special considerations for oral hygiene. So the definition is the ability to use suitable items to clean teeth, dentures if applicable, the ability to remove and replace dentures from and to the mouth, and manage equipment for soaking and rinsing them. So the guidance says if a patient does not perform oral hygiene during your home care visit, determine the patient's abilities based on the patient's performance of similar activities during the assessment or on the patient and or caregiver report. So that's a good example of where you can actually get a report about an activity. Let's look at a scenario. The helper provides steadying assistance to Mr. S as he walks to the bathroom. The helper applies toothpaste onto Mr. S's toothbrush. Mr. S then brushes his teeth at the sink in the bathroom without physical assistance or supervision. Once Mr. S is done brushing his teeth and washing his hands and face, the helper returns and provides steadying assistance as the patient walks back to his bed. So how would we code oral hygiene? 05 is set up or clean up assistance. 04 is supervision or touching assistance. 03 is partial assistance. 02 is substantial or maximal assistance. How would you code that? If you said A, set up or clean up assistance, you would be correct. Some of you may have chosen partial assistance or supervision or touching assistance. So let's look at the rationale. The helper provides set up assistance. He put the toothpaste on the toothbrush before Mr. S brushes his teeth. So we are not to consider assistance provided to get two or from the bathroom to score oral hygiene, okay? So no assistance to or from, just the activity itself. So let's talk about assessing the patient's discharge goals at start of care. This is a little bit different for us because this is not something we have been doing as a practice relating to the functional goals, especially as nurses in the home. So during start of care or resumption of care, the functional assessment, Mr. M states he prefers to bathe himself rather than depending on helpers or his wife to perform this activity. The clinician assesses Mr. M's start of care, resumption of care performance for shower and the ability to bathe himself and determines the helper performs more than half the effort. The assessing clinician using professional judgment available information and collaboration as allowed anticipates that by discharge, Mr. M will require a helper for less than half of the activity to shower or bathe himself. So how would you code the start of care performance? If you said zero to substantial maximal effort uh, assistance, that would be correct. And what about the discharge goal? Zero three, partial moderate assistance. So here's the rationale. 
As start of care or resumption of care during the assessment, Mr. M participates in the activity to shower and bathe himself, but a helper performs more than half the activity, which is the definition of substantial or maximal assistance. The assessing clinician expects that Mr. M has the potential to improve in performance of this activity. So remember I talked about the rehab potential. So this is it in action. To the extent that a helper needs to assist for less than half the activity, and the, which is the definition for partial or moderate assistance. GG0170 mobility. Licensed clinicians may assess the patient's performance based on direct observation which is preferred, as well as reports from the patient clinicians, care staff, and our family. And again, when possible, CMS invites a multidisciplinary approach to the patient assessment, and that is great news. As you can see, looking at this item, it has the same coding key that we just used for GG0130. And this information is collected at start of care, resumption of care, follow up, and discharge. And of course, the information looks different on the different time points. So here are the mobility responses. It's quite long. It's up to 20 responses. And this is where, you know, you have heard people saying, well, Medicare took away 28 things, but they added 20. Well, it's all in one place. And I will show you why it's only up to 20, okay? So if you're looking here, for instance, um, so we have roll left and right, sit to lying, lying to sitting on the side of the bed, sit to stand, chair bed to chair transfer, toilet transfer, car transfer, walk 10 feet, and as you can see here, it says if the start of care, resumption of care performance is coded 0, 07, 0, 9, 10, or 88, then you can skip to GG170M, which is one step curb. So that would take away walk 50 feet and walk 150 feet and walking 10 feet on uneven surfaces. Okay, now you guys don't usually see or care about skip patterns because the computer automatically does it for you. So if this item is coded that way, then I'm just saying that's minus four. So then when we get to one step, which is the curb, then there's a skip pattern again that, you know, because think about it, if, if the patient can't walk 10 feet, then they can't walk 150. And if they can't climb one step, then surely they cannot climb four or 12. And so a skip pattern is um, indicated here, which would take us to uh, P, which is picking up the object. And then when we get to Q, they're asking about the use of a wheelchair and or a scooter. And R is... Are they able to wheel 50 feet with two turns? And then they want to know if it's a manual or motorized scooter. And then can they wheel 150 feet? And again, is that a manual or a motorized scooter? So again, we want to code the performance and the discharge goals with the patient's input. So you guys are probably figuring out that not documenting or providing point of care documentation is going to be very difficult under the new Medicare initiatives, as well as the COPs regarding individualized care. We know now that according to the conditions of participation, if clinicians are not formulating the individualized plan of care with the patient, and um, ensuring that the patient knows what their goals are. That is a level one, I should say a conditional level one deficiency. And so we can avoid that by simply just providing point of care documentation. And then I want you guys to think about the meaningful measures that were reviewed in part one of this series as we seek to understand the why of this information. Uh, Medicare is very concerned about improving patient care and about involving patients 
in their care process because if we develop the best care plans in the world, if the patient is not a part of that care plan and they don't agree with um, what we are saying should be their goals, then it's not going to make a difference. So if nothing else, I want you to understand that what we do every day for patients makes a big difference as we try to affect change in decreasing uh, rehospitalizations and improving the health of the population. Okay, so let's look at role left to right uh, coding tips. Clinical judgment should be used to determine what is considered a lying position for the patient. So for example, a clinician could determine that a patient's preferred slightly elevated resting position is the lying position for that patient. Another tip is that at the time of the assessment, if the patient is unable to lie flat in the bed due to medical conditions or restrictions, but they could perform this activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury, we're going to code them. That's right, 88. Not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns. And then likewise, if they could not perform the activity prior to the episode, you would code them 09, not applicable. So let's look at an example of lying to sitting on the side of the bed. Mrs. H is recovering from a spinal fusion. At start of care, she rolls to her right side and pushes herself up from the bed to get from a lying to a seated position. The therapist provides needed verbal cues to guide Miss H as she safely uses her hands and arms to support her trunk and avoid twisting as she raises herself from the bed. Miss H then safely maneuvers to the edge of the bed, finally lowering her feet to the floor to complete the activity without hands-on assistance. And I just want to interject here right quickly that, you know, therapists need to please be sure that you assess the patient before providing intervention. So anytime we are doing evaluations or assessments, we want to document what the patient is doing without our intervention. So here, um, unlike the mood questions, the clinician doesn't serve as a helper, and it's not based upon a helper. It's based upon the patient's ability. Here with the GG questions, as a clinician, if you are providing helper assistance, that is okay in the GG questions. But we just want to make sure that we score patients before we provide interventions. Okay, so you wouldn't say because you instructed the patient, now they know how to do it and they're independent. You want to document what happened prior to them becoming independent. Okay, so how would you code it? Zero four, supervision or touching assistance would be the correct answer. The rationale is the therapist provides verbal cues only as Miss H safely moves from a lying to a sitting position on the side of the bed with her feet on the floor. Let's look at another example. The patient is obese and recovering from surgery for spinal stenosis with lower extremity weakness. The caregiver partially lifts the patient's trunk to fully upright sitting position on the bed and minimally lifts each leg toward the edge of the bed. The patient then scoots toward the edge of the bed, placing both feet flat onto the floor. The patient completes most of the activity himself. How would you score that? Enter 03, partial moderate assistance. Here's another example. The patient states he wishes he could get out of bed himself rather than depending on his wife to help. At the start of care, the patient requires his wife to do most of the effort. Based on the patient's prior functional status, his current diagnoses, the expected length of stay, and his motivation to improve, the clinician expects that by discharge, the patient would likely only require assistance helping his legs off the bed to complete the supine to sitting task. 
Start of care resumption of care performance would be zero to substantial maximal assistance because the caregiver, his wife, is providing more than half. But for discharge, it would be partial moderate assistance as the discharge goal. And that is based upon the patient's prior functional status and his current diagnoses. Again, we're looking at the rehab potential. Let's look at D, sit to stand. This activity includes the patient coming to a standing position from sitting in a chair, wheelchair, or on the side of the bed. So immediately you see we have to get a routine for understanding how we are supposed to be performing this activity. We're going to score the patient according to the amount of helper assistance required to safely complete the activity. If the only help a patient need to complete the sit to stand activity is for a helper to retrieve an assistive device or adaptive equipment, then enter 05, which is set up or clean up assistance. Chair to bed to chair transfer. This activity begins with the patient sitting in a chair, wheelchair, or at the edge of the bed, and transferring to sitting in a chair, wheelchair, or at the edge of the bed. So that's some transferring activity. And again, you know, therapists, this is their domain. Therapists do this all the time. So I would certainly suggest, you know, maybe therapy share some of their techniques with nurses to try to make this easier. If a patient is being evaluated by a therapist, then uh, nurses may not have to worry about this as much depending upon your agency policies and procedures. But uh, certainly if the patient does not have therapy, uh, clinicians will definitely need to have a system in place. So sit to lying and lying to sitting are not assessed as a part of this activity. And if a mechanical lift is used to assist in transferring a patient for a chair bed to chair transfer, and two helpers are needed to assist with a mechanical lift transfer, then code 01 dependent, even if the patient assists with any part of the chair bed to chair transfer. So again, that's another coding rule where, you know, as clinicians, we're like, uh, my patient not depending, they're helping. Well, you have to know the rules, and the rules state if two people, anytime there, there's a need for two helpers, that patient will always be coded as dependent. All right, let's code this situation. So Mr. L had a stroke and uses a wheelchair for mobility. When Mr. L gets out of bed at start of care, the therapist moves the wheelchair into the correct position and locks the brakes so that Mr. L can transfer into the wheelchair safely. Mr. L transfers into the wheelchair by himself without the need of supervision or assistance from the transfer. The family reports that Mr. L does transfer safely without the need for supervision once the wheelchair is placed and locked. The nurse does not expect Mr. L's mobility status to change by discharge. So again, in this situation, the therapist is assessing the patient, but he's also um, getting information from the family because you know sometimes maybe they could report that the patient had a near fall or that the patient is unsafe. So we have to make sure we are fully assessing the situation. So let's code the start of care performance. What do you think it is? If you answered 05, set up or clean up assistance, that would be correct. And the discharge goal would be 05, set up or clean up assistance as well. So the rationale is a helper must provide set up assistance only. When set up is provided, Mr. L transfers safely and does not need supervision or physical assistance during the transfer. The nurse suspects that Mr. L will continue to need wheelchair setup assistance for this transfer at discharge. Now, 
basically the discharge goal could be independence if the therapist is working with the patient. The discharge goal could definitely be independence. So it would depend upon the clinical expertise of the assessing clinician. Toilet transfer. This activity includes the patients getting on and off a toilet or commode. The use of assistive devices and adaptive equipment, such as a grab bar or elevated toilet, that is required to complete the toilet transfer should not affect the coding. So if the only help a patient needs to complete the toilet transfer or activity is for a helper to retrieve and place a toilet seat riser and remove it after patient use, then enter code 05, setup or cleanup assistance. You guys are seeing a pattern here by now, I'm, I'm hoping. Toileting hygiene and clothing management are not considered as a part of the toileting transferring activity. And that makes sense because this is GG170 functional mobility is what we're looking at here. If the patient requires assistance from two or more helpers to get on and off the toilet or commode, then we would answer 01, dependent. So you see how that works. It doesn't matter what the activity is, the responses are the same. So anytime two or more helpers are required for any activity, we will code that as 01, dependent. Okay, car transfer. Now this activity includes transferring in and out of a car or van on the passenger side. It does not include opening or closing the car door or fastening the seatbelt. If the patient is not able to attempt car transfers, for example, because no car is available or there are weather or environmental constraints, and the patient's usual status cannot be determined based on patient or caregiver report, then you will code not attempted due to environmental limitations. So again, we can get patient or caregiver report. So clinicians may not be excited to take a patient outside to see if they can transfer on the passenger side. And Medicare is saying here that we can get a report on that issue. And certainly if uh, the patient's goal is to be able to get into a car independently, that may be a goal for therapy. If at the time of the assessment, the patient is unable to attempt car transfers and could not perform the car transfers prior to the current illness, that's right, We're, we will code them not applicable. You guys are getting this, this is easy. All right, let's talk about walking. So the first one is walk 10 feet. Remember there's walk 10 feet, then there's walk 50 and turn twice, and then walk 150 feet, and then walk for 10 feet on uneven surfaces. And I won't go through all of those, but again, it's gonna be important to have a routine. And I would think that every therapist in the room has a routine for how they assess because they do this all the time with patients. So again, you this is starting from a standing position and this activity includes walking at least 10 feet in a room, a corridor, or a similar space. Use of assisted devices and adaptive equipment, for instance, a cane or a leg brace required to complete the walking activity should not affect coding of the activity. So again, if, if you're a therapist or you're a nurse and you know that if this patient had a walker, they could walk independently down the hallway, but for them to be safe, you have to actually provide intermittent contact guarding or you know assisting them with walking, you will code the patient based upon the amount of helper assistance that you're having to give to the patient. So not based upon the fact that they need a walker or any other equipment, okay? If the only help a patient needs to complete the walking activity is for a helper to retrieve and place the walker and or put it away after the patient use, then we will enter 05, 
setup or cleanup assistance. Let's look at walking 150 feet. So again, they will start from a standing position and they will walk 150 feet in a corridor or similar space. And then they gave us some more guidance and said that if the patient's environment does not accommodate a walk of 150 feet without turns, but the patient demonstrates the ability to walk with or without assistance 150 feet with turns, without jeopardizing the patient's safety, code this using the six-point scale. So even if they can't walk straight, they still want you to code it using that six-point scale if the patient can walk 150 feet, although they're having to turn, in other words. And then again, we're not going to consider the use of assistive devices or adaptive equipment whenever we are coding activity. So let's look at an example. Mr. R has recent endurance limitations due to an exacerbation of heart failure and is only walking about 30 feet before he tires, loses strength, and must sit and rest. He reports he was walking 150 feet or more with his cane prior to this exacerbation of his heart failure. So how will we code him at start of care? 88, activity not attempted due to medical or safety concerns. So he couldn't perform it because he cannot walk more than 30 feet. The rationale is the activity was not attempted due to Mr. R's recent endurance limitations and current medical condition, but he was able to complete the activity prior to the recent exacerbation of his condition. Okay, let's look at a special practice scenario regarding walking. Mrs. J uses a rolling walker to ambulate. Can Mrs. J be considered independent for this GG section regarding walking? I'll let you guys think about that a minute. If you answered yes, that would be correct. The rationale is that the GG questions are scored based upon the need for a helper to assist with an activity. If the patient is safe with ambulation, they could easily be coded as 06, independent. And at M1860, they could be coded as 02, two-handed device or no device with intermittent human assistance or supervision. So... Hopefully, if someone is QA in your charts, they go through OASIS training because automatically a lot of these answers between the GG questions and the M1800 questions are going to seem like they're contradictory, and they're not. We're following the rules. So the rules for M1860 is the patient has a walker. So I'm going to code them 02, they walk with a walker. But for GG, if I don't have to do anything, their walker is there, they can transfer, they can get up and walk independently, then I would code them 06 independent for ambulation under the GG. And it's not contradictory, okay? One step curb. So this is GG 170M. This activity includes the patient going up and down a curb and or one step. Again, the use of assistive devices and adaptive equipment should not affect the coding. So if they need a railing or a cane, we cannot consider that. We have to look at how much helper assistance do they need. The skip pattern exists here. If the performance is coded 07, 09, 10, or 88, we're going to skip to GG 0170P, which is picking up an object. And again, if they can't walk up one step, they will not be able to walk up for 12. So let's look at an example. So Mrs. Z had a stroke and needs to learn how to step up and down one step to enter and exit her home. At start of care, the physical therapist provides needed verbal cueing as Mrs. Z uses her quad cane to aid her balance in stepping up and back down one step. The therapist does not provide any physical assistance. 
So how would you code step one? Okay, zero four, supervision or touching assistance. The rationale is the patient needs only verbal cueing to complete the activity of stepping up and down one step. So here with the GG sections, you know, you probably have gotten the hint that we talked about the J1800 and the J1900s, which is fall and fall, major falls or, you know, an injury that is not a major injury. Because falls are so prevalent among the elderly, it's important to assess their safety and to find out, you know, how are they getting into the car? What barriers are present in their home? And how can we as healthcare providers make their environment safer? So that is a part of the rationale for having to collect all of this information. 12 steps. This activity includes the patient going up and down 12 steps with or without a rail. We're not gonna consider the use of assistive devices. And if at the time of the assessment, the patient is unable to complete the activity due to a physician prescribed restriction, for instance, no stair climbing for two weeks, but could perform this activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation or injury. Yes, we would code that 88 not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. See, I know you guys have this information and you're going to be expert at completing it. So now let's look at picking up an object. We're almost there, guys. The activity includes the patient bending, stooping from a standing position to pick up a small object, such as a spoon from the floor. Again, use of assistive devices and adaptive equipment is not considered. And if at the time of the assessment, the patient is unable to complete the activity, for instance, is unable to stand and could not stand to perform this activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury, we would code 09, not applicable. And I have telepathy. I know what, especially the nurses, what you guys are thinking, I'm not going to assess a patient picking up an object because they could fall over and then I'm going to be in trouble and I'm going to have to enter that the patient fell. So again, use your clinical judgment. If you know that the patient can pick up objects if they have a reacher, if they have a reacher, score them based upon the reacher. If they don't have a reacher and you know that a reacher will be ordered and maybe occupational therapy will be working on that, do not score the patient based upon what it is that you guys plan to do to make it safe for them to pick up the object. Just score the helper assistance or why you could not code that particular question at the time. All right, let's practice coding. So Mr. P has a neurologic condition that has resulted in coordination and balance problems. At start of care, he reports he and his wife worked with the OT in the sniff on picking things off the floor. He demonstrates how he stoops to pick up a pencil from the floor as his wife provides the right amount of verbal cues for safety and stands by ready to help in case he loses his balance. So let's code this for start of care. How would you code it? If you said zero 04, supervision or touching assistance, that would be correct. And the rationale is a caregiver is needed to provide verbal cues and standby assistance when Mr. P picks up an object due to his coordination issues. All right, so that concludes this OASIS webinar. Get ready for OASIS D with confidence. It is my hope that when answering the GG130 and GG170 questions, you will code only according to the amount of helper assistance required to complete a task. And for codes zero through one, which represents dependence through independence, that you will ask first what assistance is required using the yes, no formula that's in the table that was presented and then choose the best response once you answer yes. 
So uh, that table is a part of the coding cheat sheet that's under the resources at the end of the presentation. You can print it there. Also, if a patient cannot currently perform an activity and was not able to perform that activity prior to this current illness, injury, or exacerbation, you will need to code 09 not applicable. And if a patient cannot currently perform an activity, but was able to form that activity prior to this current illness, injury, or exacerbation, you will code 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns. And most importantly, the MOO 1800 questions are assessed and responded to differently than the GG functional abilities and goal questions. Again, these two slides were basically an overview of the changes for more in-depth training, um, especially if you have a desire to be OASIS certified or if you just want to be a subject matter expert in your agency. We do have on-demand videos. Right now, OASIS C2 is there, and we will be replacing those videos with OASIS D. Here is a list of resources for examples and further guidance in the OASIS D. Again, many questions have been sent to Medicare for clarity, so please, please keep, keep track of the quarterly Q&As as we certainly expect updates to the guidance for OASIS D. And I included the link here. And then here is where you can print extra resources as far as the coding sheet, and then we have the functional question. Those resources are here. These are present and explained in the C2 that you can find on our On Demand. On behalf of Access, thank you for all that you do to make lives so much better for our patients, and we are here to help and assist you in any way that we can. After all, your success is our success. Thank you for joining our On Demand training today and for choosing Access, a provider of innovative, cloud-based software, services, and solutions to help home health organizations improve patient care and grow their business. Access is the only healthcare technology company approved to award continuing education credits by the American Nurses Credentialing Center and is also the most recommended home health software on Software Advice. You can watch more on-demand training videos through our software or at access.com, where you can also find tutorials, blogs, white papers, and answers to frequently asked questions. Thanks again for choosing Access.